Hello and welcome to Always Take Notes. In this episode, Simon spoke to the playwright and screenwriter James Graham. So James is one of the most prominent uh, young playwrights in London and we had a wide-ranging conversation. We talked about what it is to be a playwright, how it works, how that world, which I'm not that familiar with, functions. We talked about some of his work researching and writing drama based on both contemporary and slightly older uh, political events. And we discussed his screenwriting work, particularly the Brexit project he did with Benedict Cumberbatch. Enjoy. So I'm here with James Graham. Uh, James, thanks so much for taking the time to be on the podcast. You're it's welcome. Uh, excellent to have you here. I was wondering if we could dive in as, as a sort of starting point of our conversation. If you could talk about when when this house kind of exploded, like when did it sort of break out and you felt you were like breaking out as a playwright? And my point of reference for this as someone who doesn't know that much about theatre is... Um, there's a Anthony Burgess novel called Earthly Powers. It's like a retelling of the... Do you know it? I don't actually. I've heard of it, but I've never read it. Yeah, it's basically a retelling of Life of Somerset Maugham. And it talks about like when he broke out as a playwright in 1917. And he goes from sort of living in a sort of filthy bedsit somewhere in London to being in a suite at the Ritz in like silk pyjamas and stuff like that. So when, you know, when, when were you clear that this was sort of going to be a big thing? Oh, well, there was no silk pyjamas or the Ritz. I still went back from my National Theatre play to my flat in Tooting. But um, it, I mean, yeah, it was uh, being at the National Theatre, I think, for playwrights feels a bit like that's the mecca of playwriting. You you, you want to be there. It's, as soon as you walk down those corridors, you can feel the ghosts of, of actors and playwrights from the past. Um, and so this house was, um, I mean, I, I, it came about because in 2010, we had our first coalition government for many years, the first Hong Parliament since the 1970s. And I already knew of this story about um, the Hong Parliament of 74 to 79 being... Where from? I think you, you normally, I find you come across uh, new potential plays or films when you're doing another one. Yeah. So I think I was doing a play about Margaret Thatcher um, very early days. I was just getting started uh, at the Finnborough Theatre, which is a tiny pub theatre in Earl's Court in London. And I was doing sort of a, a conventional biopic of Margaret Thatcher. And I came across the fact that the vote of no confidence that her into power in 1979... Was this guy in Leeds. Was this guy in Leeds. And was, it was, he, it was, they fell, the government, Callaghan government, fell by one single vote. Um, and you can attribute that vote, if you wish, to a guy who couldn't make it down from Leeds because he was too ill. And I just thought, what has to happen for a parliament to get to the point when it can survive or, be, or fall based yeah. on the presence of one man or not? So I sort of stored that in my head. And then when 2010 happened and the craziness of that hung parliament... I decided to just, you know, it's not original. It's what Shakespeare did and the Greeks did. You go back to a past equivalent to make sense of the now. And I'd always wanted to look at that building. Parliament, I'd been intimidated by it. I didn't know how it worked. Um, But it's rituals and procedures. So I thought maybe going back to this time, the 70s, would help make sense of the Conservative Lib Dem coalition. And just pitched it and went to the uh, artistic director. And I imagined... I, in my head, a line snaking out of the National Theatre the morning after that election that had that Tom Stoppard in it and Alan Bennett and David Hare all pitching, all pitching the same damn thing. Um, and thankfully, um, Nick Heitner, the director at the time, trusted me to go off and, and, and write it. And so was is the big thing getting a play in the National? Or did, was, it, was it then, did it kind of, was there a grid review that broke it? Or what sort of, what was the key like? I, yeah, I think there's several stages. Getting getting the commission was felt uh, felt huge to me. I remember walking out onto the banks of the Thames, feeling uh, not vindicated, feeling um, yeah validated would be the right word uh, about being a playwright. But then immediately imposter syndrome sets in yeah. as soon as you start to try and type. And it took me ages. I remember the first five ten pages took me many many months. How would you pitch it? Had you did you write a or did you no, just, I just I sort of went in. Um, I didn't yet have probably the, the name recognition to get all the way to the top of the building to the artistic director, but I knew the literary manager because he'd come and seen some of my shows in okay. some of the smaller spaces, and he said. And Heitner's well, been there by seven years or something by this point. By this right? point, yeah, and it was going yeah. well. They had Warhorse in the West End, and it, it, it was it was it was earning it was punching above its weight, and it had a, a credibility as well as a commercial success to it. Um, and so, as their job is to sort of find new writers and they asked me if uh, I wanted to consider a commission but I think what they were saying was do you want to write a three person four person play in a room and we'll put it in the smallest space and that's how you sort of earn your stripes as a writer and I came back saying I think I want to write a three hour epic with 
50 characters in it is that all right and i probably and these wasn't big, like dynamic choreographed scenes and yeah i mean i didn't know aesthetically or visually what it would look like but i knew it was going to have to be a pretty big pretty big thing and they still whacked me in the smaller space but i, I did think <laughs> i'm just going to make it impossible for them to not put me in the olivier and they put me in the, the, the cars low at the time before it moved to the olivier but yeah so that feeling i felt really um i just felt so happy and then traumatized uh that would have been i think i was 28 yeah. Um, uh, and for some reason I just found it I, I, I overly uh, invested the creation of that play with too much too much significance so I thought well I can't possibly write this play for the National Theatre in thing, my you're, bedroom you, you're, you're, the, it's fascinating that it's that way around you got the commission then you wrote it it's not like yeah. you, you write the thing and then you're shopping and I think I have to say I think that's right I think if you're as a writer I mean that never happened in my career before that yeah. I wrote mainly for free and had to do jobs to sustain yourself and then if you're lucky and I never was you'd maybe get some royalties if uh, on like a profit share basis so this was the first sort of real time that had happened um, and I was stupid I, 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 I sort of lost my mind a bit because I went I thought well I can't write a play for the National Theatre in my bedroom because I only had a bedroom in a rented flat in London so I, I used a lot of that commission to hire an office which is so stupid don't ever do that yeah. and just blew some most of that money but I thought I needed like a space to write this in um, and I just I, I, I trod through it way too carefully like it was this sacred because uh, it has so much like, emotional yeah I just imbued level. it with, with too much importance and I should have just smashed through it in the way I did my other plays so it took me about a year that one and I, I normally pride myself on being able to do at least a first draft yeah. relatively quickly sometimes in a matter of weeks um, and I just yeah that one really struggled can we we'll, we'll come back to that in a minute but can we fold back now like right to your sort of beginnings as a as a writer and so forth so growing up in in Nottinghamshire when what were your sort of early um literary beginnings and i saw on the film you were doing you know your ice dancing and oh, stuff yeah. like that as well but when when did you decide you wanted to write and what drew you to writing drama as well for me it was television drama that really had a huge impact growing up i didn't really have much theater apart from the local panto every yeah. christmas and school school plays um i i remember there was a period of really incredible um Often quite northern working class dramas in the in the nineteen nineties. Like this life, and but that this life was a great one, yeah. But I, I particularly from the output of Granada TV okay. studios in Manchester, you get things like Cracker and Prime Suspect and Band of Gold, um, Jimmy McGovern, Sally Wainwright, Paul Abbott, uh, obviously Alan Bleasdale, even early in that in the nineteen eighties. There were dramas was that, that Lee were... Child, who then, he was working there as well. Oh, really? Yeah, I How think so. I think wow, we funny. want to get on the podcast, but I think his origin story is that he was fired from Granada TV during a restructuring in 1995. Oh, was so angry, go. he created Jack Reacher. Well, he's doing all right now, yeah. yeah. I'm not worried about him. Uh, but it, it, from from the, from that um, school, from that, that culture, also came Russell T. Davies and, and Stephen Moffat, people who were trained in that. that. And it just felt like dramas that were, were uh, politically aware, that came from a social, socio-cultural moment. Um, and that could capture a community that I recognise as being being my own. Yeah. Um, so I would stay up far too late when I was eight, nine, ten years old with my mum watching adult dramas after nine o'clock, and they just absolutely captivated me. So I, I, I knew always I, I was quite a um, private kid. I wasn't shy, but I, I preferred my own company, and I would just sometimes just sit in my room writing prose, mainly not scripts, yeah. prose and short stories. Probably thinking maybe be a novelist, but certainly the word playwright had never. Contemplated and or heard. Did, did being a writer in any you know sense did that seem a viable thing from where you did you know anyone who was doing that? Come no, from never met anyone. Class, yeah, never North, met anyone yeah. who was who would call themselves a writer. But no, I mean, I, I, my 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 parent, my mum bought me a typewriter when I was like five years yeah. old, and nobody. I wish I could say it was the Billy Elliot story where yeah. they tutted at me and rolled their eyes and wanted to send me down the mine, but actually they were just very encouraging. They wanted they were happy to read my my bad short stories and. And let me go off and do school plays and, and things like that. So when we had Peter Moffat on, he said that, you know, he wanted to write plays. That was his thing. And then he wrote his first one and then he was offered a TV commission. And he saw the financial difference between it. And his wife was like, right, this is what you're doing from now on. But did you did you want stuff on stage? Was that kind of key? Yeah, it wasn't uh, just a means to getting onto television. As soon as I discovered theatre and I discovered it by acting in plays, in, in school plays. Yeah. I had a really good drama teacher who encouraged shy kids like me but also cool kids on the football team to come and, and do do plays and immediately loved both the process of building a show with a group of people over a matter of weeks and then just the without getting romantic and sentimental and cliche the the electricity that happens 
in a in a live space where you're sharing something in the moment with a community of people which you don't get on screen I completely fell in love with it. So they, my school, um, a comprehensive school in Nottingham, created the first time they'd ever done an A-level drama for mm-hmm. a group of people who wanted to carry on with that work. And from that, I went to university and then started writing plays there and taking them to the Edinburgh Festival. So theatre just became a huge... I didn't know enough about it. I felt really embarrassed when I arrived at university and I'd never heard of Brecht. And in fact, I remember some, um, at the time, Nick Heitner, to circle yeah. back, had just been made the artistic director of the National Theatre. And the department was a gog and a buzz and excited that there was a new director at the National Theatre. And I never, I didn't know we had a National Theatre. Okay. They certainly hadn't told to Mansfield. You were studying drama at university? Just pure drama, yeah. yeah. Um, it was a great course in Hull. Uh, it was a practical course. You would learn acting, sound design, light, light design. You had to sew costumes, build sets. Was the sort of Philip Larkin ghost? Absolutely, there, yeah. So yeah. the library where you would go and study was obviously he was the librarian there. And a great um, uh, legacy and tradition of screenwriters. You had uh, Anthony Minghella. Yeah. who was the Oscar-winning director and writer who died about 10 years ago. He came and did a workshop with us. Hull itself, um, recently, the City of Culture, has John Godber, who is, I think, the most performed English-speaking playwright behind And Andrew Bay. Marvell, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, they have now, now they have a great um, A less contemporary writer. But yeah. yeah, sure. <laughs> um, so it felt, yes, it felt like a writer's city and a, and a writer's department. But yeah, so it was theatre, 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 and I was very happy just to stay. Were you still acting theater. at that stage? Mm, sort of. I wasn't. I wasn't massively good. I was passable as an actor. Because how I'm again, you know, I, this is not real world. I know, but that, you know, being acting and writing, how much of a crossover is there between those two things? Do you think? Well, as we're seeing now, there's um, a, a real lot, you know, buzz people of people bridge, on the bridge, and uh, you know, go back to James Corden or Ricky Gervais, or mainly in comedy, I guess. But the excitement of having. A, um, a star vehicle for the person who's writing it feels, I don't know, the, the sense of ownership and the complete own- authored world that those, those people can create. I, um, I, think, I think that's great, but I do believe that they're also entirely separate disciplines and uh, I don't necessarily assume a great actor can, can be a great writer and vice versa. But I, what I do enjoy and what I do love is working with actors in a rehearsal room and trusting their instincts and if they're struggling with something... Um, you have to interrogate what that is and if their if they're, their objective is confused or if they're, sorry to be cliche, their motivation isn't immediately apparent or satisfying, that's great. You, you, you want to soak that, up, that stuff yeah. up as a writer and listen to that. And so what is the path to becoming a playwright? I mean, I'm, again, I'm very familiar with how it works journalistically or in okay. terms of people writing fiction or non-fiction, but you know, how, do you, how do you do that? And how did you kind of find out as someone who was not coming from this Milo, kind of feel your way through that? Yeah, it's a good question, and I'm guessing that there's no one single path. I think the first the first barrier to leap over is the psychological one, that yeah, just, just not even imagining that that's something that's completely viable or, or accessible to most people. Um, but once you sort of once you once you establish a love of theatre, you start reading play scripts. You buy them online for two quid, and you get access to to the the, the three the, you know the architectural drawing of a play, and you think, yeah, I could replicate that. I could put my voice into that. I, oh, the only thing I can say is what I did was uh, well, I spent two years working in other jobs and trying to find time to finish a play. And then what other you, jobs were you doing? I was doing. I tried to do artistic really related stuff. I was a stage doorkeeper at the Nottingham Theatre Royal, uh, which is basically the person backstage who welcomes new companies and sorts out dressing rooms and actors and the crew. Uh, so that was great. So I got to see touring West End shows passing through week by week by week. But on the downtimes when the show up, was show was up, I would be I would be typing away. Mm. And I, as soon as I got out of university, I, I panicked. I thought I must leap into this industry now. And I was churning out mediocre plays and sending them around the country and hearing nothing back. So I calmed yeah, who myself are the, down. Who are the gatekeepers? Like, do you send to agents or are you sending straight to theatres? Well, way back when it was, you would send to most publicly funded, subsidised theatres will have a literary department where there's a literary manager yeah. or at least associate directors whose job it is to read plays that's getting my, my interpretation is that getting that's getting quite narrow now mm. and um often there's this term unsolicited where if you don't uh if you're not if you're not represented by not an agent yeah. they won't accept unsolicited scripts um but but certainly big theaters like the national theater and the royal court and big regional hubs like the west yorkshire playhouse they they will often especially if you have a local connection yeah. they will um they will read your script and give you feedback so that's all i did i just sent off plays um and i tried to do my research 
find the kinds of theatre that programmed the kinds of work that I was beginning to write, which was political histories, which at the time wasn't massively fashionable yeah. for young writers to be doing. Uh, and I, I found the Finborough Theatre, which um, which was just, just, it felt, yeah, it felt like that was the right fit for me. I was writing a play about where, where Albert Einstein's, um, the Finborough. Yeah, yes, where, where the, it? It's in Earl's Court okay. in London. It's like a 50-seater, very sure. tiny, very small. Um, I was writing a play about Albert Einstein and his guilt about the atomic bomb and the, the political, um, uh, how he wrote letters to Truman and trying to encourage, encourage was he that. Was Princeton by then? Was he? Kind of he was, yeah, yeah. yeah, and, his, yeah and, he, and he'd written parts of his diary. And so I, I imagined the last days of his life when he was working out his, his legacy. Um, and kind it of was like doing. Of Copenhagen vein. Yeah, yeah, but so more reflective than that, but it's, um, and more naturalistic than that. But it was, I'm not saying it was a great play, but it was, I wrote it during the Iraq War, right. and the words weapons of mass destruction were all, all prevailing. And I went back, which I would frequently do uh, for the rest of my writing life, go back to the past equivalent of what was the first, yeah. what was the origins of weapons of mass destruction, and then try and find a strange angle into it. And I thought a physicist would be a fun way to do that. And I sent it off and got a call three weeks later from the artistic director, uh, who couldn't afford to pay me anything, but just okay. encouraged me to keep to keep going. And I established and did they put it on? with that. Yeah, so about a year later they put that on. Okay. It was the first time I got to work with professional actors, um, yeah. and it, you and you have a four week rehearsal period, and then you stage it. You stage it and get judged. The national critics come and watch it in the same way that they would watch something with a much bigger budget and time yeah. preparation. But they and suddenly. You know, I remember that first morning I walked out, walked out, got went to the local garage and bought a copy of the Times, knowing that my uh, review would be and in you're there. You were twenty four. That would know. I would have been about twenty one at that point, okay. twenty one, twenty two. And you open the page and you wait to see your name in print, um, yeah. and it was quite a, quite a thing, quite a feeling. Did you get paid? No. Okay. No, in fact, I had to use um, some of my overdraft. I, you know, the generous overdrafts that you get for the student uh, student um, account. I use some of that to even contribute to some of the, the funding. So debt, and you, you're debt. saying working with writers, is that, you know, again, forgive me, this is a very foolish question, but is it standard with, you know, new writing that the writer will be in the room in the rehearsal space? or And are directors, are they cool with that? Absolutely. Well, for in this, in the English culture of making plays in the British um, system, the writer is God okay. and people... I uh, can Even champion or uh, no, sorry, living speaking. So if you're doing a new play, um, rightly or wrongly, most of the mechanics around a theatre is, is 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 the writer at the centre of that process, okay. which obviously I'm biased, but I think that's great. And there there is even a culture of um, the right to fail. So the the court, for example, the Royal Court in London, will champion a risky play from a, a new writer that yeah. may or may not succeed on critical or commercial terms. But that is the point. The point is to try and, and trying to fail and to nurture okay. new voices. So you will find yourself, and it can be quite intimidating. But you'll find yourself at the very centre of the of the process, uh, whether that's development, write, uh, readings, workshops before they put the play on, or certainly once you start rehearsing. Yes, absolutely. The director would want you there in the room. And you establish a relationship about how that's going to work. Personally, I'm always happy to sit right at the back of the room and let the director lead. And if I have thoughts, I will pass them on to her or him in a, in a private moment. And I would also uh, try and establish a system whereby I can learn and rewrite overnight and come in with new mm -hmm. pages in the, in the morning and keep testing it and keep testing it. And, and that's the way I like to work. And when did you come to London? I moved down here, I think, in 2003. And did that feel a necessary thing to do? I'm afraid so, yeah. I was ab I ha absolutely hated it at first. I, yeah. I, I found it very intimidating and you don't know anybody. Um, unfortunately, I still think it's useful. I think it's getting a bit better. We're finding you could absolutely um, have a career, I think, as a playwright living in Manchester, living in Edinburgh, living in Sheffield. But um, weirdly, it's harder for theatre, uh, sorry, for TV at the moment. Okay. All of the broadcasters are based down here and all of the independent TV production companies who make the majority of the work will often be based in the south or the southeast. So I find that the number of meetings you have to do on a, on a weekly basis when yeah. you're developing a piece of television, you find, you find yourself in Soho far too often. All the time. Yeah. yeah. And so how did you then make your way from when you'd, you'd had what one thing performed professionally when you came down? Yeah. Um, I, I, didn't, I wasn't able to financially support myself just from playwriting uh, for five years after that, I would say. Okay. Um, and that was probably t a television commission uh, for my first TV job. 
But then what that changed it that, that meant I could just about just be a, a writer and not do bar work and call centre work. Yeah. Well, yeah. What other work were you doing during that time? It was yeah, a mixture of bar work. I did some promotional work. I was the guy who would stop you in the street and try and get you to answer a questionnaire or yeah. give money to charity. Um, I, I tried to do stuff that was flexible, so that meant I could, if I had to be in a rehearsal, I would be. And then, in terms of getting other stuff on, on stage, how, yeah. how was that working? So, from my first show, it's a, getting getting an agent is a bit chicken and egg. You often can't get an agent until you've had something on, but you can't yeah. have something on until you get an agent. But I think if you can find yourself doing work on the fringe or doing stuff at festivals the Edinburgh Festival obviously the most obvious one to just get work on and get invite people to come and see it um I did get I invited a uh, literary agent to come and watch the first play I did and my first agent is still my agent Mm -hmm. now uh, who are Curtis Brown so I got signed up with them and they offer you support and they can um give you meetings uh, arrange you to meet contacts send your work to theatres who yep. only accept solicited work introduce you to publishers so I got the play published and that was just really exciting to Does see that matter? in a bookshop that a significant thing? I don't know if it matters in terms of providing you with opportunities it mattered to me to see my my play in a bookshop and yep. telling my mum to go to Waterstones and go look look it's not a made up thing I'm doing it's real and it was online on Amazon and that you know that stupid stuff just feels really important at the time and in terms of the, the way the broader profession worked how many your professional playwrights are there say in the UK or is that the wrong way to think about it are these people who are writing TV here and plays here or you know I, I, I couldn't say but there's not enough from and is there a li- I mean you're, you're obviously at a real top of this but is there kind of a living in it you know if you look yeah. at novelists like the number of people who make a living purely writing prose fiction is pretty small um, but with with playwriting is there how, I mean how do the kind of financials and economics of it it's really brutal I would say um probably only 20 percent get to get to sustain a, a decent living without really? having to top it up with something else yeah. i think ultimately the it, it, like being absolutely honest that there is there I, for the first eight years of my life it was um of my writing life it was really tough but you don't mind it because you think well i've got to earn my stripes and yeah. i didn't mind having to do other jobs um and then then when i did my play at the national this house it for the first time the dynamic completely shifted because I that because that show transferred to the Olivier and yeah. there were a thousand seats in the Olivier and that show ran for about three months. It's the first time that you le- that I leapfrogged everybody else making okay. the work. I got I was, I was it was possible for me to be paid more than the director, more than the actors, including okay. famous actors who I've been watching on TV. Suddenly, I became the most well paid um, person in the room, okay. and that never happened before. And you're being paid a commission of. Sorry to be so good. Like, no, it's absolutely right. No, this people is, find this interesting, you know, interesting stuff. Like, you're paid at what, a proportion of the, the take from tickets? Or how does that work? Yeah, the first thing you get paid would be a, a script commission to go and write the play or the TV drama that you're yeah. doing. And I think at the time, I was probably paid about six or seven thousand pounds to um, write the play. Eight years ago to write that play that's gone okay. up by now. And do you get it all up front? Or? You get it in installments. Yeah. The for hit, Go away and write it. Here's two grand. When you deliver the first draft, here's another. Yeah. Another. Um, all the way up to the final payment and there's no guarantee then that they will stage that play mm-hmm. or that that TV channel will broadcast your episode yeah. so they pay you anyway as they should to write it if they then produce it yes then the next time you might get paid it is, is box office royalties and I think and it varies but that might be anywhere between 5 and 8 9% of, okay. the, of the royalties um, and you know other different models would include and loop the directors and other creatives into that as well yeah so it is possible when you do a sold out run at a big theater or a West End theater, you might find yourself with a, 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 a bit of money that comes all at once that you yeah. hadn't expected. I would argue <laughs> that um, that is absolutely right because not you don't know when your next play is going to be. Yeah. And I have never had a play on in the Olivier since and it may be that it takes you five, ten years to get your next big How, play. Why, what got it into Olivier? We so this so this house it was produced in the smallest theatre, the Cottesloe, which is probably about I don't know five hundred seats. And no, I, I guess because it's a new play, I was an unknown voice, yeah. and it was a play. Let's be honest, that on paper it didn't commercially sound massively sexy. It was a play set in the nineteen seventies Parliament uh, with with politicians that no one had heard of, whips yeah. in the whips office. And it was essentially a drama about legislation not getting passed in the mm. 1970s. But I hoped people would get really excited about um, seeing Parliament from that strange angle. Yeah. 
and it just uh, th- thank god touchwood it did critically well and it sold out and um it attracted for whatever reason a, the kind of buzz that you can't really define but you 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 become aware of if you're being really honest you're aware that people are talking about yeah, your yeah. play um and how with theater again forgive me this is a, it's a naive question how much of it is a kind of subsidized world and how much of it is a commercial world in this country we're very very lucky we're not quite like germany's the subsidy is huge and yeah uh, nicholas heiner in his autobiography talks about that right? yeah, yeah how, like, i mean the, the, the european model is, european is massive and you're allowed to really indulge yourself and you can you know you can take 20 weeks to rehearse your play if you want and you only stage it when you're ready and there's no in, there's no necessity to, to be for it to be commercially viable in this country yeah the subsidy model it's 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 well in london it's it's pretty good um and you know the national theater the royal court the Hampstead theater the donmar warehouse these are all places which get money from yeah. the taxpayer uh, for them to allow to enact an artistic model that is slightly uh, that you're allowed to take risks with work then there is the commercial sector which is the west end which would be private entirely often private funding and they, those those shows have to make their money back so there are commercial incentives to casting star actors or doing plays that yeah. you think will will sell out um in the in the it, it's it's tougher in in regional theaters the majority of the arts funding cuts that happened as a result of austerity have been absorbed by local councils withdrawing funding from most local theaters or arts bodies so they have a much much tougher life um and i was we're jumping around a bit here but in in the film you sent me there's the, the where well, you're talking about the play you write in the constituency office where you're talking to gloria del piero you say you, know, you wanted this to be a west end comedy and you were like unashamed about that like what is a west end comedy what what makes what defines that? Yeah, I suppose I, I said that because I suppose I, I when I would travel down as a sixteen, seventeen year old with my family, you I, the first theatre I ever experienced was big, tarty commercial stuff. I think mm. the first thing I saw in the West End, like many people, was probably Les Mis. Mm. Um, so I have an affection for it. I have, there's so many problems with it. I think it's I think we're actually we are living through a pretty extraordinarily good time in the West End. When I first moved down here ten years ago, there was a huge outpouring of. Um, frustration that there were no new plays there were no new writers the kinds of writers weren't representative of the demographic mm. of Britain and it was all musicals or movies on stage I, I think we're in a pretty healthy position it's definitely not perfect but um, there, there's a lot of new work uh, in the West End at the moment and strong um, serious plays with big ideas that is getting a commercial audience yeah. so Labour of Love the play um, you referenced was a play set in my hometown of Kirkby and Ashfield near Nottinghamshire um, about a local constituency office, a Labour MP, and uh, but I wrote it as a, it was a West End commission. It was then that was the first time that happened. Normally, you're attached to buildings and there's concrete and bricks, and you go in that building and you get a commission, mm. and there's a rehearsal room in there. This was a, uh, a commercial producer, Michael Grandage, and Nick Frankfort, who wanted something to put in a West End theatre that they wouldn't know what that West End theatre would be. But they would get a script, they would attach actors to it, they would attach a director to it, they would find a building, and they would put it on for a 16-week run in a West End theatre. And that is a different proposition yeah. to being in a subsidised sector. And when did you start, when did you first do TV work? Was that on the back of this house? No, I managed to sneak one in before that. I had an idea, um, it was, I think it was in 2008, and it was a story of a, a real-life story, again, as, as became my thing of a um, a local Lincolnshire council worker who was obsessed by Elvis Presley and um, she managed to amass through stealing parking meter money um, uh, through through stealing parking meter money she managed to amass a fortune and establish the world's largest collection of Elvis Presley memorabilia in her attic which was all stolen so it was a it was like a Boxing Day ITV single drama um, which I really enjoyed it was great fun and there was like a self-contained film mm. So that was a paycheck that allowed me to become a, a, a full-time writer. And then I never really Can came back to TV. God, back then, uh, you were, I think I was paid. You, on a broadcaster like BBC One, ITV or Channel 4, you get a uh, you get the fee for writing it, which I think was probably 15000 And then when it's on, you get a, something called the principal photography fee, which is which on the, is the, on the right? yes. Well, actually, no, that's the same again. Okay. Um, so you get the, the script fee again uh, on the first day of filming. So it's sort of a well done for getting your script to okay. the point where it's actually shooting. So you double your money um, if you get it made. And how much was it? So overall, I probably got paid 30000 for that okay. entire project. Because yeah, I which, remember when we had Peter on, he was like, he wrote, he'd written some, you know, 
critically well received plays right. and then he wrote an episode of Cavan and QC and he was like wow this is this yeah. is like a lot more money you know? yeah it was but having said that again for whatever reason that com- didn't that paled in significance to um, the remuneration I got for this house in oh, the, really? the Olivier yeah. and oh, this will sound um, uh, falsely uh, worthy but I, I, I did have a I found that really I did struggle with that a bit I found there was a moment of huge guilt that uh, everybody from the person who commissioned it to the actors to the designers to the director I, I, I received this paycheck um, yeah, that I you, felt was completely on, on in terms of um, the percentages I, it felt vastly vastly over what I thought I deserved but you wrote it I know I wrote it but it takes a village to, to raise a child and it takes yeah. a theatre to put a play on and I, I, you know, now all that money has gone and I, that probably lasted me a year and I was really grateful. But yeah. at the time I thought it was just the percentage difference between what the director was getting, what I was getting. Sure. I couldn't quite get my head around that. And the, with the TV work and the work you've done subsequently, how has your work and your way of working fitted with what has happened to TV in the last 20 years? You know, the advent of these big ambitious yeah. and particularly kind of like the writer's room, you know, the idea you'd have a, a showrunner and multiple writers and stuff. How does your working method compare to that way of running things yeah well it's i when i first tried to um get ideas away and it took I, I, to be honest I, I getting an original idea away with a with a tv producer or a network it, it took me about eight years nine years i got so many reject so much rejection and you would spend time working on tv series that you've never seen and the, the, you could absolutely spend the majority of your writing life as a, as a tv writer just developing ideas that you get a bit of seed money for but they never see the light of day monster by joan didion it's it's on my shelf no. i have i would recommend it by an american oh, cool. writer and it's about how you know joan didion famous american long-form writer sustained her lavish lifestyle for years by doing script doctoring for hollywood i've seen that documentary like, about her that um i think it's on netflix yeah, yeah nothing yeah. ever gets made yeah but this book again i, I may be praising this wrong but it's about how like she and her husband wrote a spec script about a sort of really troubled movie anchor who had like a violent sex life big drug problem and killed herself and then it got bought by disney okay and it got and it ended up being made in this like eight years and 17 drafts later in this sort of schmaltzy robert redford vehicle and the story and but you know they got paid a lot of money yeah throughout that yeah um i I, ultimately after sort of two or three years of doing that the idea of oh well at least i'm getting paid this is going to completely faded away i just wanted i just wanted really? to, it yeah. to materialize into work that you could be shared and you could engage with people and so that took a long time in fact actually the the after 2008 this elvis comedy the next time that happened i think was um my own idea was around 2015 which was a drama called coalition on channel four yeah which was about the 2010 negotiation and that was your right, and that was your idea that was my idea and that was the first time I'd gone to a producer or a broadcaster and said, here's my idea, and it ended up on screen. And w- were you were you working in this kind of showrunner model then, or was it just no, you so, writing um, stuff? I'd done a bit of that. Um, I'd done, spend my time, quite a few, I think quite a few of us, uh, playwrights, screenwriters, you'd, you'd, who now get their own ideas on TV, people like Mike Barlett for Dr. Foster or Jack Thorne or um, Lucy Kirkwood. They, uh, I did a stint on Lucy Preble's Sex Diaries of a Call Girl, okay. um, which was great fun. As a writer. As a writer, yeah. So yeah. You, and that was, a, it was sort of an American model where you sit around it as a table, uh, with, eight with writers with a whiteboard. Yeah. You're planning the whole series. There is a lead writer. It's their show. They created it. Um, you eventually will sort of be assigned your episode, but you know where it fits in the whole scheme of things because you've been in a room developing the whole thing. You're writing... Um, in the voice of a character that's not yours, that you've not created, but that you're trying to replicate and feel consistent. And that's a great discipline. It's really tough. It's really hard. And you dr- you do draft after draft after draft with a script editor and a producer giving you notes after notes after notes. So that was good. No, my other stuff mainly has been me on my own um, yeah. as a single writer doing a single film, which will be enjoyed in one sitting. And I haven't really got to enjoy that big American LA writer's room yeah. where, you, where you do that stuff. Can we talk about, you know, your interest in in this kind of historical stuff and engaging mm. with current events and things like that both where did that come from and then your your method your research method for for you know finding this stuff out i think it, I, it, I, I think it was an accident that I, I the first play i ever wrote was based on interviewing people from my hometown about the miners strike okay. and Not- nottinghamshire being 
a particularly um, unique place and a minor strike in that it split from the majority of the country and, and broke away and formed its own union. So it was a, it was a crucible of ideological turmoil, mm. um, which can draw lines all the way through to Brexit now. The uh, So I, I, that was my first, it was, a, so it was a political history, I guess. And the second play I wrote carried on that, that thread of, of trying to make sense of the now by going back to the recent past in the form of the Einstein play I did. And I guess I just carried on. I was just encouraged to keep uh, mining recent post-war British yeah. history as a resource for great stories. And I Had think anyone the, else done this? There's well, like it's, it normally it's a thing you do. Stuff. It's the stuff that you're meant to do towards the end of your writing life and you're right. meant to be called Sir David or Sir Tom before you even try it. And But, you know, those people like David Hare was a huge influence on me. The um, His play... Permanent Way was one of the first, was the first play I saw at the National Theatre. Is that about the nationalisation of the world? It was. So it was, a, a, it was a, again, like my, hopefully my plays on paper, it's an absolutely unpromising idea for an in, entertaining night at the theatre. It was about the privatisation of the railways, but yeah. in it was this was this romantic idea about the, the death of Britain or the change of Britain being a different contract between people and the state or something, ownership. Uh, and I found it absolutely devastating and glorious. So... Yeah, politically motivated, probably vaguely historical stories. And I think because I am a narrative writer, I'm, I'm driven by story, which is not necessarily the case across British theatre and mm-hmm. certainly not across European theatre. The, you, you'll have heard people speaking of um, post-drama, post-dramatic plays. We, are, we were meant uh, with Brecht to, be, to have left story and narrative behind and the purpose of theatre, particularly political theatre, was to provoke or experiment in different ways. It's all about form, it's about style, it's about what your intention is for the audience and what the audience should should leave. Whereas you write stories about political theatre. Whereas I theater. sort of write stories. And the argument against, the Brecht's argument against dramatic theatre, narratives with a beginning, a middle and an end, is that it was, that, was, that was bourgeois and that was self-serving. Middle class people would go to the theatre and they'd be satisfied. And the point of theatre was not to satisfy you, it was to anger you, to provoke you, to... to, to to unplug you from the matrix rather than yeah. plug you into the matrix. I would now strongly disagree with that. I, I think sometimes uh, experimental theatre that, that indulges itself in an attempt to shake up theatre and break a form, whilst as much as I love that as a, as a playwright, I, I worry that that's become the new bourgeois elitist theatre yeah. um, that excludes a whole whole audience who, who, who because of, in the age of Netflix engages with difficult ideas through story through I, was gonna, I was gonna say yeah do you do you worry that theater itself is an exclusionary medium oh massively yeah huge problems because you have to physically remove yourself and put yourself somewhere else where there are where there are barriers of class uh, geography and, cost, cost and as well. the biggest one being of course cost yeah you have to, to get you, there are people at the doors of a theater saying where's your ticket or, if you I don't mean, give I, them I, you can't come I in. think it's very interesting in that you know I, I often wonder about the different forms of writing in different times and you know if you're an ambitious writer in 1590 you'd be writing first drama right it was like what people did or if you're an ambitious writer in 1815 you'd be writing like you know byron type poetry but and you know like martin that martin amos line that like drama is a dead art or the the drama is a dead art what's your kind of feeling to people who or is you know or you know why theater when you could write for netflix and a billion people could watch it or things like that is there something about the kind of crucible the fact that it's like all the things that make it exclusionary kind of make it magic as well. I, yeah, I think that's well put because, well, it, look, it's 2,000 years old and it's survived everything. It's, if it survived yeah. the advent of commercial television and it survived Netflix. I think other things are threatened by the subscriber online platform base. Yeah. Um, pop, I mean, I talked. The to, first I, thing to go will be will be linear television. Yeah. I think that's more likely to be threatened than than theatre. And I, I think, talked to a publisher a few weeks ago who thought the novel was threatened by. Okay. Yeah. But you know the death. I mean, the the novel was had didn't have its best year last year in terms of sales. Theatre is still really popular. There are huge problems to solve in terms of who goes and who gets to make it. Um, but I, I think it feeds an, a human instinct and a social instinct to be together in a space with people. And as the rest of our entertainment gravitates to being more of a private experience, even movies, apart from your big. Um, big tent movies throughout the year whether it's an Avengers movie or a Star Wars movie yeah. people aren't going to the cinema anymore they're watching those movies uh, not even just on, on screen with their family they're watching it in a different room on their own on their phone away from the family so I think 
there's just a huge need to be part of a community still. And what theatre can do, unlike any other art form, this will sound horrifically sentimental, but there was a recent, I think, London School of Economics study that measured um, an audience's heartbeat. And in the theatre, okay. a heart, the heartbeats of an audience starts to become in time with itself. and It starts to become uniform. Oh, really? And even though that's a really naff metaphor, I do think there's something in that about, especially now, especially today, especially with tribalism and 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 the political divisions that we have in this country there is something about getting people together in a space and sharing a moment and tapping into the more reasonable empathetic parts of ourself through a story that's played out in front of us and sharing that with people around you i mean one thing i was interested in again watching that film was that you know you've you've had this extraordinary way of getting these facts and the material of what happened and crafting that but because you're doing it through drama like everyone loves you. This is what I thought was very interesting and that people are sort of willing, you know, from my experience with a journalist, like if you want to, you know, reach into a difficult situation and like, you know, find the narrative of what comes out, you know, you don't necessarily have the people you've written about sort of smiling and talking about how grateful they are for you afterwards. But the fact that it's sort of dramatised, even if it's only removed a few steps Mm. or even that it's in a theatre or something like that, seems to kind of give a sort of licence do you think? I mean, how did that? How do how well, the yeah, people? How do the people? Maybe a similar way is like, the people you write plays about seem extremely positive about the plays you've written about them. Is that, is which, that which universal? Can be, which can be good and bad. I think yeah. that it is a, it's a possibly a problem if you're writing a play about Rupert Murdoch and he enjoys it too much. I fully accept. You, yeah, that. you accept. You you kind of delved into that. In, yeah. Uh, Look, they're, they're meant to not enjoy it too much, and that's that's the proposition. But what but what I what I unapologetically strive to do is is to not misrepresent. And I think you can give these people a defence and a platform and a voice whilst also prosecute them in a way that is humane. Yeah. So, and to understand all is to forgive, right? You yeah, know. and, and, and uh, the, the, act of, the act of watching a play is to walk through the footsteps of somebody you would normally not even possibly uh, uh, think about doing that. So that, you know, I, I imagine there's a, you know, let's be honest, theatre is a majority liberal, progressive audience. Yeah. Um, probably majority left wing, and I'm sure they wouldn't normally countenance the, the the endeavor of going. Why does Rupert Murdoch do what he does? What's he trying to do? What's yeah. the most generous version in my head I can imagine? And of taking his him at a different time in his career, right? and exactly, and that yeah. helps that you go. I I, I I took him as a younger. We man said this is Inc. James's play Inc. Yeah. This is the play Inc. Currently running on Broadway. If you happen to be in New York, um, yeah. So seeing him as a younger man with all the doubts and uncertainties and anxieties that a younger man might have naturally made him possibly a little more of an empathetic character yeah. but to you know to, 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 to just paint him as a villain who um poisoned the well of, of, of polite uh, news and, and discourse is to well it's politically and it's dramatically innate i think it's better to show a man who is trying to do something you may disagree with um but that you have to walk through his footsteps and understand why he's doing it and i still want you know pe- people still left that play going yeah still not a massive fan of the sun but I think they were surprised that they'd had a two and a half hour journey of, of just, I hope, a more reasoned, nuanced uh, interrogation of something you would normally just block outright. And how do you go about researching this stuff? You know, getting these people to... So you go to those people who, who then smile about you in a documentary afterwards and and, and, and I just... But I did, to, to your point earlier about, well, what's the difference between journalism and playwriting and why, yeah. do, why do the people you interview be, maintain a suspicion... Whereas people like to see themselves on stage and on screen. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think with journalism, the objective, I think, is for someone to say, like, it's kind of similar, this was fair. You know, I may not agree with all of this, but, like, yeah. this was fair, right. you know, and that you've... You, or what, what I strive to do with my work, which is completely different, is, you know, to, you're writing about a, different, a world, you're going into a different world, and what I want is someone who's in that world afterwards to come and be like, this is bang on. Right. You okay. know, that, yeah, yeah. that, for me, is the yeah, most yeah, satisfying yeah. thing as a... Yeah, well, well me policy. too. So the best, the most satisfaction I got from this house was having all those politicians come over the river from the House of Parliament and sit and watch it and go, yeah, that's what it feels like to be in a late night vote when it's tied or when it's a really knife edge uh, count. Um, I, that really satisfied me and I was really pleased about that. And that's what, that's in a way, that's what I'm interested in when I go and interview these people. It's yeah. not about finding a gotcha. It's not about them slipping up and telling me something they didn't mean to. It's conveying the sense of the world of what it feels like to be in these environments that feel very distant from the majority of the audience. Most people don't know what it's like 
to be in a tabloid newspaper office in the 1960s, what it yeah. smells like, what it feels like, what time does it start, where do you get your lunch from, how much smoke is there, when do you lot. start drinking? <laughs> yes, a lot. And how much swearing is there? A lot. Um, and in a way, I think people are initially confused that that's the stuff I go in on first. My first questions are never big overarching philosophical stuff yeah it's i don't understand what time do you start work do you sit opposite somebody or do you have your own desk it's but really pre- presume it's stuff. different also prying and trying to find out what happened in the 60s as opposed to like coalition or something where it's really immediate yeah so so the part so in a way yes that was harder to, well, to get the whips to stop, talk to me was pretty hard because they have a code of silence yeah. and they wouldn't probably talk to a journalist yeah but for whatever reason they did talk to a playwright eventually when I convinced them of my intentions being pure and honest I mean I, I thought a little bit as well with how political cartoonists are, you know their relationship okay, you know yeah. there's the, you know there's a legion of stories of you know politicians sort of ordering very unflattering cartoons of themselves or having a frame that's <laughs> yeah, sort of like, or you know yeah. giving you know, a bottle of wine to the cartoonist and because it's art you know, yeah, it's one step it's, removed. It's one step removed. I agree. Right. And I think that's helpful. So you, so they're nervous talking to you because you're going to quote them verbatim. Yeah. And you don't but use tape. Do I you? don't, I deliberately don't take it. I don't record my interviews so they yeah. can, I'm not going to quote them. And they're going to, there's so many filters that their information will be, will, will go through from me writing it to, to artistic license, to the actors playing them, to the audience watching them. Yeah. It's not them. It's not documentary. So they feel a bit safer. So for whatever reason, the most recent thing I did in that sort of, style was uh, Brexit uh, which yeah. was a single film with Benedict Cumberbatch on Channel 4 which dramatised Vote Leave yeah. and had it at the centre of Was that your idea? Or had it been pitched? Or? Yeah um, we didn't know what it was but I was working with um, some producers called House um, Tessa Ross and Juliet Howell and I, I just said I knew I wanted to somehow capture that campaign in the weeks after it finished but I didn't know what it was and so we optioned books and I started to try and work out what the story would be, but it took a long time to work out what the focus would be and that the focus would be the people you've never heard of again. It's yeah. not it's not the politicians, it's the strategists who who we weren't familiar with. So, you know, Dominic Cummings, who Benedict Cumberbatch played, was the director of Vote Leave. And since the since that referendum hadn't really done interviews and yeah. famously has not appeared before Parliament despite requests to give testimony, but he would say because he doesn't trust that process. Uh, so I was very grateful and surprised, and you feel a responsibility as a political playwright to use this. For whatever reason, he chose to speak to a, a playwright and, yeah. give, and, and introduce me to the other people on that team, revealed things that hadn't been revealed before. And I think to, to your point, it's because it's one step removed yeah. and it feels like, and I hope... And maybe it's more enduring, right? People think like... It's, yeah, and, you know, millions of people watch a TV drama and maybe millions of people don't read a, a, a long observer investigation. Yeah, of course, and, yeah. and so, yeah, and I, I think the, and the act of humanising people, I think, is really important. I'm, I'm a massive fan of, you know, the thick of it and Veep and the great tradition of bringing these people down through satire and through mocking them. I think that's yeah. really important. But I also think counter to that, I, 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 I enjoy doing the opposite. I enjoy doing, um, going the, entirely the other direction and humanising beyond all expectations people who you wouldn't have any sympathy for. Because what I found watching that, what I thought was interesting was, it, was, it struck me that this is written by a playwright, right? These are like tight scenes where, you know, in rooms and stuff like that. Do, were you ever tempted to kind of you know, West Wing it a bit, you know, have like... Oh, God, yeah. What, walk of, and talk and... Yeah, uh, walk and talk and like big, you know, panorama... Yeah, but I... And... Well, you know, Aaron Sorkin, I worship at the altar of... But I... Uh, no, I hope you... I mean, what you ultimately want is to find your own style and your own yeah. voice. Um, but I love... I love... I get geekily uh, fascinated by systems and processes. And I, I'm a big believer that in unlocking a process how you how the sausage is made how the sausage is made exactly how as a whip you get uh, a drunk or a sad member of parliament through the lobbies from a to b how you make a newspaper and sell it and survive how you win a referendum campaign using data and messages how you come up with those messages yeah. and how you target them i think within the the minutiae and the mundanity of that lies bigger, grander, poetical truths. And I'd be really interested to know a bit about your, your writing process. And I'm wondering if we could link that with the Brexit thing and the script leak, right? So that yeah. an earlier, an early draft is leaked. Yeah. Could you explain a bit about what your writing process is in terms of going through drafts and, you know, what what was revealed then and why yeah. was it problematic that that was revealed at that stage? I think whether it's a film, TV drama or a play, it's pretty much the same thing. I start researching and I might yeah. do that for a couple of intense weeks. 
but then I'll eventually start trying to structure through planning what okay. that story is by putting that information into Do you scenes use and what, slots. that software program for writing scripts? Final draft, yeah. yeah. It's kind of frustrating. It's the industry standard and you have to use it. Right. So you have to buy it. It's like 300 quid. It's very annoying. But luckily, um, you might have a producer who might get it for you. Yeah. Uh, and I write my screenplays on that, but I write my plays on Word. I don't okay. know why. And, you know, the first day is... But you structure, you have a structure before you start writing dialogue. Pretty much, yeah. I know know the destination. I know I'm driving from London to Leeds and I'm probably going to stay on the A1. But I will absolutely enjoy discovering a side road and going off in a different direction. But I just, I wouldn't know how to start writing if I didn't know what the end was. Okay. And into that, you have all this research. You have too much research. Um, but you start saying, okay, I'm, I'm gonna, how, how am I going to order the reveal of this information? Well, when we had Ian Rankin on, he talked about how at the beginning he used to research before writing. But then he realized that was a nightmare because you'd go down, you'd research all the stuff you wouldn't use and everything yeah, like that. Yeah. And he would then write a draft and then know, oh, right, I need to know this bit about blood testing. Or That's exactly like that. what I do, yeah. So I start just to give me the confidence that I can roughly replicate the world of a 1960s newspaper a bit so that I'm not it's almost to protect myself because the act of writing is quite humiliating as soon as you start you have this wonderful idea in your head of a play set in a newspaper offices on Fleet Street that will say something huge about the deterioration of our national conversation and then you start writing and it's so um simplistic and crude so and devastatingly like obvious. You start with a vision and then with a compromise. Right, exactly. Yeah. But you're compromising from the very beginning and it's so far away from the purity of what you imagined. It's just humiliating. And I think that's why most people don't write. That's why most people stop because yeah. it's devastating. Um, and your ego takes such a battering and you think I'm never going to get there. So I, I, I accumulate research for in that sense first to protect me from going, no, I know, I know this stuff. I know I'm going to be able to shape this into a play. But then I will start writing because exactly as Ian said, you will think your play is about one thing, but it's yeah. that you suddenly discover it's about entirely something else. And at so, what stage will you share it? What dra- How many drafts? Will I'm you go reasonably through? resilient enough to pretty much always share the first draft. I who think with? with a producer or a director, if yeah. it's TV, it'll be a producer, the people who commissioned you, and they will work with you on draft two, draft three, draft four before you show it the broadcaster before they yeah. come in on it. With a play, yeah, with the director of the theatre. And so with Brexit, what was the version that got out? And how did that change between you? It was quite close to... Um, it was quite close to the first draft. Who, Not who quite the first it? draft, we don't know. Okay. But it would be... It was a kind of draft where you... <laughs> <laughs> well, unfortunately, there, there aren't many people who it could have been. Um, okay. It was a reasonably tight circle at that point. So this was way before we had a director. This was way before we had cast and anything like that. Um, so what it in those sort of drafts when you're building it with people that you trust you just leave massive gaps mm. I was like oh insert insert research here yeah, I've yeah. no idea whether they met in a park I don't know uh, this is the basic dialogue of I think what Aaron Banks would say to Nigel Farage but I don't know yet yeah. but you need to start and then you go off and keep doing your research all the way through so the draft that um, that leaked was yeah uh, it was I, I would say it was one of the drafts where I was feeling a bit fruity and reckless and trying to find a tone. So it was a mischievous draft where I was saying, maybe we could set them on a yacht and maybe we could have it. And, you know, you should be allowed as a writer to, um, in the privacy of your own mind and your own office, to play around with that stuff, never expecting that Steve Bannon, uh, as the advisor to Donald Trump, would get hold of a copy and feedback to it. It just felt felt really dirty. I felt sick. that hundreds of people had, had, had read it and, and were feeding back on something that, that didn't even reflect my own vision of what the, the drama would be. And as a final thing, we're, we're up against our time limit, but th- this idea of, you know, that some people think it's premature to write drama about real immediate events of Brexit being in train. You, you push quite strongly back against that, right? I definitely do. I, know I absolutely understand, of course, something that feels as dangerous and as upsetting to many people as Brexit that of course there's a balance there's a responsibility to that to get it to get it right or to make sure you're doing it for the right reasons but I just oh, I don't know what what we're now like six months since that broadcast and I've never faced that level of scrutiny before and some of it was apocalyptic they would like this TV drama is going to bring down democracy and yeah. um, it's it's such a threat to society and I think in the fullness of time I hope a lot of some of that commentary feels quite un, uh, exaggerated. I, I just think, and I can, I, again, I can be overly romantic about this. That is the purpose of drama since its, since its inception 
in Greek times mm. was to was to represent the events of the day through a narrative, through a form, through character, in order to make sense of it. And sometimes it was meant to be dangerous. Sometimes it was meant to be provocative. So the idea that a, a nation or a people can't tolerate or or, or survive uh, art or storytelling as a way of making sense with the world, I just I just completely reject. And actually, I think that's so dangerous to say. Uh, we have to wait for a story to for to entirely run its course before artists can make art about mm. it. That is ludicrous. And you tell that to the beat poets of the 60s or to the musicians who wrote uh, war protest songs. Tell that to people who... Tell that to Alan Bleasdale who wrote um, Boys the, the Black Boys Black and Black stuff in the middle mm. of the... Th- you know, it's ludicrous. We have to use story to make sense of the world around us. All right, James. Well, look, that's an excellent note on which we'll finish. Thanks for being such a... Uh, gracious and candid guest and wishing you uh, all the best with your numerous projects. Thanks very much. Hello, it's us again. Ellie's insisted that this one is all about me. <laughs> that sounded really flirty <laughs> with your with your listeners. Hello. <laughs> um, Simon, how was your chat with James Graham? I really enjoyed it, actually. Um, he has a lovely house in South London, an undisclosed location where we went to. Um, and what I found interesting with that is I don't really know that much about playwriting. Um, arguably, I don't know that much about journalism either. But it was like, Can you confirm. know, <laughs> an opportunity to sit down with someone at the uh, kind of crest of their profession and just pick his brains about how it all worked, you know, and, and how you write a play and how the business side works and all that kind of thing. So I found it really interesting. Could you tell that he was a playwright? I mean, what are you saying? <laughs> don't know. No idea. <laughs> was he dressed like William Shakespeare? <laughs> he was not. Um, yeah. Was he I sort th- of pithy and funny? I, I think the bigger distinction that I've seen on the show is not between like what kind of writer someone is, but between somebody who's primarily a writer and someone who's like running a newsroom. You know, when we've had editors on and stuff, they're different. Would you agree? Yeah, I'd say journalists are super anxious and really self-deprecating, and right. editors are just like. But hang on, are you drawing a distinction between journalists and editors? Aren't editors journalists? Yeah, but they're different, different, different minds. Different species. Yeah. Every re- every New York journalist that we've interviewed has been like absolutely certain that they haven't made it. That is true. And it's yeah, 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 yeah. very anxious about their. Yeah. So ability. Graham Graham definitely in the writer camp. Um, he yeah, and definitely not you know just coming from like a different world you know definitely something of the theatre about him he'd done some acting and stuff so like more that confident. you know we, we've got a poet coming up and I'm interested to see what they're like I think there are different Tortured. kind of no doubt but he, I really he, he want didn't to generalise all of our guests into little specific categories um, yeah no it, I, I found it very interesting and it, but he's also like he's like man of the hour right yeah. you know his stuff's all over TV and he's opening stuff on Broadway and it's you know we, when we when we have like very famous but very established writers and we go like when was the moment that you like made it big you know he's like at that moment so right. that was what was interesting about it um, and also talking about how like it's come up in the interview but he'll grill you know he'll write this stuff about politicians and he's kind of reporting it out and, and all of that kind of thing and they love him for it it's like if you you know they feel completely different about being represented in a play than they would in like a documentary or in a piece of journalism. It's a bit like the political cartoon thing, mm. you know? It's mm. like there's a sort of step step away from that. Um, have you ever written a play? I have never written a play. Have you? <laughs> I've written poetry. I've written poems, yeah. We've all been there. Yeah. Um, I think that writing a play sounds very difficult. And it, you have to, well, more just you have to be really be in that flex that muscle it's very some, specific some <laughs> very explanatory hand gestures <laughs> like a clam opening no I feel it's a bit like writing um, fiction after having been a journalist for ages it's yeah, really diff- difficult, difficult to get to into do. that space I mean I'd, I'd recently read this book uh, on screenwriting called Save the Cat and I was astonished at how like how much that's about like this is the formula and you do that and I don't okay. I don't think Graham does that particularly um, and I think and I think he is a playwright first who then does some screenwriting, not right. the other way around. Mm. That was my impression. And also, that even when he's screenwriting, it's like him. It's not him in a writer's room with five or six people. Um, but Ellie, you'll have to listen to the episode. Yes, uh, I will this time. <laughs> but it's, it's not, I can't listen to it because it's not been 
edited. This has been Always Take Notes, hosted by me, Simon Oakham. And me, Eleanor Hall. Our producer is Nicola Keane. Our social media is by Zara Hankia. Our uh, graphic design is by James Edgar. And our score is by Jess Danheiser. There's more, Ellie. You have to say the social about, media stuff. I was just about to say it. Uh, always take notes on Instagram and uh, take notes. <laughs> <laughs> that will be take notes always on Twitter. Please Do I need leave, to stage an intervention? Leave a review on iTunes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that was clear. Some it's there might be there might be readers who want to leave a review early who can't who were like where please I couldn't leave I s- a review on iTunes if you have a moment. And if you've enjoyed the show, please think about contributing on Patreon. It really helps. Thanks. Bye.